I turn it over to Carla to introduce our speaker today. I just wanted to say a, a few words. First, welcome everyone to the first MVZ lunch uh, of the semester. You can go uh, on our website uh, to see the lineup of speakers that are scheduled going forward. We have some open dates, uh, particularly in March. And so if there's somebody you would like to invite uh, to speak, let me know. So we're um, open. Uh, uh, send out invitations to additional speakers. Um, <clears throat> I also just wanted to say a word about uh, COVID and where we stand. As everyone knows, the stay-at-home order has been uh, lifted for Berkeley and Alameda County. Uh, so we're now back in, I guess, the, the purple uh, category. Uh, and uh, but there are some new policies in place on campus and in particular for anybody who's coming to campus. So of course you have to have approval to come to campus, but if you are coming, uh, everybody is required to be tested weekly. Uh, and that's now in effect. And there's a badge system, which I trust everybody knows about. That's uh, an electronic badge through ETANG that there've been many emails that have gone out. So make sure you, you're getting tested weekly if you are on, on campus. Uh, I was on a call this morning uh, with the, um, EBCP and, and uh, there, you know, there's been a little uptake, uh, uptick in, in cases on campus following the break. It's not horrendous, uh, but uh, there is some concern. So please continue to, um, uh, to be careful. Uh, of course, we hope that we'll all be vaccinated uh, in a few months and start to return to normal. We're not there yet though. All right, uh, I will turn it over to Carla who's gonna introduce our speaker today. Okay, thanks Michael. So it's a pleasure to, to introduce Dan. Sorry, my cat's about to call my computer here. Um, Dan was actually scheduled to give museum lunch about, he reminded us about a year ago and everything shut down. So thanks for being willing to do this by Zoom. I met Dan when he, um, came to the MVZ in, I guess, 2015 and spent a year or more there as a visiting research scientist, um, measuring and examining over 10,000 specimens in the museum for his project that he's gonna be talking about today. And I actually put a, a link in the chat um, to the project in Arcto so you can kind of see how we track things and all the projects that have contributed to his project and the publications that have come out of it so far. Um, Dan got his bachelor's at Erd Erlen College in Indiana, a master's in biology at University of Missouri, and a PhD in zoology at the University of Florida. And he is currently the senior land bird biologist for the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory, and he's been there since he, since about 2015, since he left the museum. So um, it's a pleasure to have you, Dan, and you're gonna, he's going to talk about his research on gape width and, and birds and also introduce you to the field station, um, the Coyote, Coyote Creek Field Station. So welcome. Thanks, Carla, and hello, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. And if you're in the Bay Area, hope you're enjoying the stuff we call rain. <laughs> it's been a while. Um, so as Carlos said, I'm gonna do a two part seminar. Um, the first part is on the work I did at museum. And the second part is uh, basically an infomercial about the bird banding station we run at, uh, in the South Bay. So for the first part, um, this project grew out of a collaboration I had with uh, Sean Saker Giolu, who at the time was a sort of an extended postdoc at Stanford um, but has since moved on to University of Utah. And he has a global database on birds. And the key thing about his database is that he has each species scored for diet. So you can look up all the fruiting birds, which is what I did, or look up all the um, birds of any dietary group you want and do analyses. So we were working on, on this, um, doing a review of fruit eating birds. And one of the key aspects of birds and fruits is that the size of the fruits they can eat is gonna be limited by gape width. Um, and that's, that's a key thing. So you can see this quetzal here, it's got a little avocado that's about as big a thing as it can swallow. It's constrained of course by the 
you know, the bones here on the jaw. They can, this part of the gape is a little bit fleshy and, and distensible, but they, you know, I can't go beyond the bones there. Uh, as part of this review that we were working on, um, there are about 4,000 birds that eat fruit, and at least to some degree. And using that list, I started to list out all the plant species that fruit eating birds eat and potentially disperse the seeds of, and that's about 68,000 species, which is about 25% of all seed plants. But of course, with this many bird species, um, the seed treatment varies, and so their quality of seed dispersers varies considerably. Um, so during the course of this uh, work, we wanted to make a graph on the conservation status of fruit eating birds and using gape width as a proxy for size because, as I said, gape width determines the size of fruits they can eat and their relative role has seed dispersers and ecosystems. And so the first summer I measured about 400 species and we came up with this graph showing gape width in the bars and then conservation status percentage of the species at that size uh, at risk, some level of, of conservation risk. And indeed shows what's fairly obvious from reading the literature is that large, uh, large fruit eating birds, and in this case, fruit eating birds with larger gapes tend to be more at risk uh, than the smaller species. And so while I was doing that, um, I realized what an amazing collection was at MVZ. And at the same time, I knew from working in seed dispersal and birds for several years at that point that there wasn't a compilation of gape width measurements for birds. Um, what mostly the measurements for birds are bill width, which is usually taken right here at the front end of the nostril openings. Whereas gape width is back here and is much, much wider than bill width. In some cases, it's gonna be twice as big. And so ecologically speaking, you can't say much with bill width in terms of the roles as potential uh, consumers of various size seeds and fruits. Whereas gape width is what we really needed. So I decided to uh, continue measuring specimens. Um, I also plotted the initial data. So these are the first 376 species. And it looked like there were two groups developing. So there's one, potentially one group up here and the second group up here. I thought maybe these were two different sort of evolutionary trajectories where the highly forgivorous, more high quality seed dispersers are this upper line, which tend to have higher gape per body mass. And then the kind of the regular lower quality dispersers are down here. So I wanted to explore that a little bit too. Um, so what I did was try to measure 10 specimens for each species if they were there and five male and five female, if that was possible. Um, and also recorded um, body mass in particular, if they had it, because for some species, we needed the body mass uh, measurements. And then over the course of the next year and a half or so, I came in once or twice a week and measured as many as I could and eventually got through um, the whole collection of, of study skins and over 10,000 specimens. I did make one trip over to the Cal Academy and I got almost 500 specimens there. I need to go back and uh, finish theirs. I only got about halfway through the Cal Academy collection. So overall, I have gape width data for over a little bit over 2,000 species, which is about half of the species in our frugivorous bird database. I also um, classified each species in terms of the predominant way that it treats seeds. <clears throat> so the standard sort of default strategy for birds is to swallow the fruit whole and defecate the seeds. The second strategy is to swallow the fruit and then regurgitate large seeds in particular. They might pass small seeds. The third category 
um, especially in the neotropics, are mashers where they hold the fruit in the bill and squeeze it until the seed drops out and then eat the pulp or sometimes just the juice. Um, and then I also lumped in this category other forms of sort of cheating, at least from the plant's perspective, as they'll eat the pulp, but, but not the seeds. Um, the fourth strategy is swallowing fruits and then digesting most seeds, although some small seeds uh, may pass through. And then the final category are seed predators, which actually, um, although they're eating fruits, they're also eating the seeds specifically and they crush the seed in their bill. So things like parrots and um, sparrows and finches. Now there's a, of course, a continuum of these, but I forced each species to be in only one category, um, at least for this first attempt. And then I took uh, from Sean's database, he has the diet scored from one to 10. So for each species, if it's a one, then it's up to 10% of the diet is fruit. If it's a 10, then it's close to 100% of the diet is fruit. I simplified these into three categories of low, medium, and high. And so the low category is, is trace amounts of fruit up to about 30%. Medium is 31 to 60%. And then high is over 60% over fruit. OK, so here's the full data set. And interestingly, if, in terms of the regression line, it's basically the same as the initial set of 376. So I was you know, worried that maybe I was picking the, you know, the snazzy big birds or something, but it turns out the gape mass relationship is the same uh, for that initial set and the, and the whole, whole set. One point you may notice is this one way up here in the top right, that's the Southern cassowary, which interestingly falls exactly on the regression line um, with and without you get the same regression model, which is kind of interesting. So it's in the body mass sense, but in terms of the gape mass relationship, it's, it's just like everybody else. Um, here's the so the updated conservation status, and it's again shows the same thing that we showed before. If anything, it shows that a higher percentage of the large birds are at conservation risk. So let's look at level of forgivery and seed treatment now. Um, for level of forgivery, you can see the blue is the high, highly forgiver species, orange is medium. Um, there's a tendency for the blue ones to be up here and very few of the low, uh, low levels of fruit in this upper wing. But overall, the slopes and intercepts for these three groups are indistinguishable. So surprisingly, there's not much going on with the level of forgivery. Seed treatment though, things get a little more interesting. Um, you can see here that these green dots are the regurgitators. These blue dots are the digestive seed predators. You can see this a little better if I add the regression lines, um, where the slopes for the regurgitators um, and interestingly, the, uh, the cheaters in this green one, those two have the same slope, uh, whereas the other three groups have a slightly uh, shallower slope. But even so, it's, it's hard to see what's going on. So I'll show you each of the five treatment groups highlighted in black with all the rest of the points white. So this on the top left, these are strategy one with the swallow fruits hole and defecate seeds in black. And then the rest of the species are in white. And here you can, I think, see the patterns better is that the regurgitators tend to be sort of on the upper side of the gape mass relationship. In other words, they tend to have larger gapes per body mass than the, the, the group as a whole. Um, the defecators, again, this is the default strategy for birds, so they're all over the place. Although, interestingly, they're not too much on this upper tier. 
Um, cheaters, as you can see, tend to be small birds in body mass, uh, except for a few up here, which are um, some of the corvids. And seed digesters, interestingly, are um, low, smaller gape width per body mass than the other groups. And outright seed predators are in the middle, sort of indistinguishable from the defecating group. So that's kind of interesting. Um, it raises the question though, if this is um, some characteristic that's related to eating fruit or if it's just a taxonomic or phylogenetic signal um, on, that's, that's imposing itself here. So let's look at by orders, and this is too messy for you to look at, obviously, because there's too many groups. So I can show you with regression lines, maybe there's some structure, um, but I'll spare you going through all these groups and just show a few highlights here, uh, some notable fruit eating groups. <clears throat> so the trogons, uh, at least the new world trogons are highly forgivorous and generally thought to be good seed dispersers. And you can see those are part of the top tier. Um, and they're also regurgitators. Uh, let's skip over to the top right. These are hornbills. Again, this is forming a good part of this upper line here. There's a couple that are buried in the, in the mass here. Not all the hornbills are highly forgivorous, but, but many of them are. And then in the top middle, the, the pitsiformes, this group this is a big group, but it includes toucans, which are um, most of, where's the cursor? Most of these points here are toucans. And then it also includes barbets, which are some of most of these ones down here. And then it also includes woodpeckers and some other things like honey guides. So those are down in here. Um, in the bottom <clears throat> middle of the bottom row, there's, uh, these are turcos. These are in Africa, and these are generally thought to be good seed dispersers, and they regurgitate seeds. Um, notice they're just falling in the middle. They don't seem to have especially large gape per body mass compared to the, the three groups that we looked at at the top. Uh, and then pigeons and doves on the bottom right. <clears throat> this is a big group. And they're mostly seed predators, although some swallow and pass seeds intact. And those those two are intermixed. But again, they have gape per body mass than, than the rest of the group. And a, no difference really between whether they're actual digestive seed predators or swallow and pass seeds. And then the, the last order, uh, the perching birds, that's basically half of all species. And I need to look at this in terms of family. Um, this kind of work, uh, I mean, I'm a field biologist, so I don't know how to work with phylogenies, but I need to collaborate with someone who can help me figure that part of this out. Because it, clearly it looks like there's a taxonomic signal here or phylogenetic that we saw earlier. Okay. And that was a quick look at that data set. And I want to thank uh, people that helped me measure and then Carla and Jack and Mo for access to the specimens. Um, should I pause for questions or just go on to the next part? Uh, maybe go on and then we can do questions at the end. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> All right, so the second um, part I wanted to talk about is the bird banding station that we run uh, at Coyote Creek Field Station. This is one of the projects of the San Francisco Bay Bird Observatory. And we are located in the South Bay. Um, right there. Um, the green blobs here are the salt ponds. And the green ones in particular are the ones that are part of the National Wildlife Refuge, the Don Edwards Refuge. These red ones are ones that Cargill still operates and produces salt in. 
Um, but some of the landmarks here, there's Moffett Field. This is Google over here. Um, Coyote Creek is this little thin green line that comes through the city and comes out into the bay right here. This is the county line for Alameda and Santa Clara. Um, so more specifically, we are in the near the intersection of Interstate 880 right here and Highway 237, uh, right at the edge of the bay. And right, this is Coyote Creek right there. In, uh, in the 30s before World War II, this was all agricultural land. So the banning station is right in this area here. Uh, and specifically, this field was a pear orchard at that time up until the 1970s. Now, of course, um, it's all developed. Um, this photo from a plane in 1985 shows, here's Interstate 80 going across, 880 going across the top. Um, there were still some ag fields at that time. The banding station is in this area. And now, of course, everything is filled in. Even this little grassy field across the creek from us has a building on it now. Um, so we're very much an island in a sort of an urban matrix with a nice sewage treatment ponds uh, to the west of us. So here's the close up of. Uh, with the creek on the east side, you can kind of see the dark line running through the trees here. And there was a little strip of woods that had um, along both sides of the creek that had been there for, for decades. The water district, which owns this land, built levees on both sides of the creek in, um, in the 80s. And as part of that, they restored or revegetated two parcels. So one they did in 1987, the second one they did in 1993. And between those, they maintain an overflow channel as part of their flood control strategy um, that's mowed once a year. Um, and it does actually fill up when there's high water in the creek. And the two revegetation projects literally started from nothing. So this is a picture of the 1987 revegetation um, getting started. So we have 48 nets total, and we band on Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday each week, and each is a different set of nets. So there's 14 nets in the north tier that we run on Saturdays. Another 15 nets on Wednesdays, and then 19 nets that we do on Sundays. And we've done these exact locations since 1995. Um, there were two, a couple little blips in the data set uh, where we missed a couple months for one reason or another, but it's been continuous more or less since 1995. We have data. Um, going back to 1982, um, and we're working on trying to clean that up to get a continuous data set. I can talk about that later if we have time. Um, so in each of the four habitats, we have 12 nets, uh, more or less. And we operate on typical banding station procedures, much like a map station. Um, we open for five hours a day, starting 30 minutes before sunrise except if the weather is not conducive to uh, safe operation of the nets and safe conditions for the birds. And we check the nets every 30 minutes at least and usually more frequently than that. Uh, and much of the work is done by volunteers. The data we collect, uh, again, basic uh, maps data, monitoring avian productivity and survival is compatible with that program. Um, so for the banding data, we um, have, of course, the specific date, time, and the specific net where the bird was caught, the species, or in some cases, subspecies, um, wing cord and body mass. And then the key things are the age, sex, and how we determine that, when we can determine it, the reproductive condition, uh, which is shown in this picture, looking for cloacal protuberance or brood patch, um, whether the skull is 
completely ossified or not. <clears throat> That's an indication of age. Fat condition, feather condition, any molt, and then anything else interesting, parasites or injuries and so on. So those are all the things that we collect for each individual that we catch. That's the, the banding data I'm referring to. The other set of data are the, the daily summary sheets where we record the, the number of hours each net was up and weather conditions and, and other factors that um, when you're using banding data, you need to correlate the capture rates with these other factors. Okay, so just a summary of, of the data. Um, this is average number of captures uh, in each month over the last 20 years. And all these graphs are standardized per net for 100 net hours because, of course, different years we have different numbers of, of hours that the nets were open from one reason or another. Uh, even though we have standard procedures, sometimes there's, we have to close in the rain or the wind or when there's a flood, we can't go out there, things like that. <clears throat> um, so this shows, so the overall capture rate is the black line and you can see that the the slow time of year is in late summer, so July to August. The busiest time is in fall migration. And then through the winter, things are fairly busy. There's a small peak in spring migration. We've had a decline in the last 20 years in, in the total capture rates that we have. And this is mainly from, so that's in the black line. And that's pattern is caused by the decline in new birds captures. So these are birds that we haven't caught and banded before, as opposed to recaptures, where the capture rate for them is pretty steady over the last 20 years. And we've also had a slight decline in species richness, although this varies a lot. And it mainly has to do with what, um, what species we get during migration when we get more species, but fewer individuals of each species. The habitats, we get higher numbers of captures in the more recent restoration, the 1993 restoration, and in the overflow channel, surprisingly. Um, both of those are significantly higher than the earlier restoration and the remnant woodland. And that's both in terms of new birds and recaptured birds. Then looking quickly at the four habitats, uh, again, in the same order, the 1993 restoration, the more recent one, um, again, we've had a decline in the rate of captures that's mostly due to fewer newly banded birds that we're getting, whereas recaptures declined a little bit, but not significantly. Um, in the overflow channel, again, is steady rates, and that's not surprising because this gets mowed every year, so it's a fairly stable habitat. It's similar from one year to the next, whereas, of course, the restorations are been growing uh, and the conditions there are changing for some species. In the earlier restoration, um, similar pattern to the 1993 restoration, where total captures are declining and that's caused by a decline in newly banded birds. And in the remnant woodland, things are fairly stable, although there is some indication that we're getting an increase in the recapture rate, which I don't quite understand. It basically means we're catching the same birds more frequently now than we did earlier. Um, so we're getting a decline in capture rates in both of the restored habitats. And that's probably at least in part related to the growth of the vegetation um, growing up and then above the net level. So the birds are gonna be most active probably in the canopies of the bushes and trees. And as that level gets above the net level, we, the capture rates will go down. Um, I mentioned the recapture rate in the riparian woodland seems to have increased. I don't quite understand what that means. Um, and then overall, the capture rates are higher in the two restored areas than in, than in the other two habitats. 
Um, just looking at the kinds of species that we catch, um, there's three broad groups. One are the residents that are around all year, more or less. So the most common, common ones in that category are song sparrow, common yellowthroat, Buick wren, and bush tit. We got a fair number of migrants. The most prominent of those are Swainson's thrush, Wilson's warbler, yellow warbler, and Pacific slope flycatcher. Um, although in, in our data, we listed as Western flycatcher because it's in the hand, you can't distinguish them from the Cordillera flycatcher. And then temperate migrants, these are mostly species that breed farther north and spend the winter or the non-breeding season um, in our area. So hermit thrush, um, yellow rump warbler, both subspecies of that, white crown sparrow, two subspecies of that, golden crown sparrow and fox sparrow. And then looking at those groups a little bit, um, for the resident species, um, capture rates have actually gone up a little bit. Again, appear to be related to increase in recapture rates. Whereas the temperate migrants, so these are the winter residents, have gone down mainly because we're getting fewer of them apparently. And then the neotropical migrants, also even more steep decline, again, because it's getting fewer uh, newly banded birds. And then I wanted to um, <clears throat> just describe what we do um, and our possibility of collaboration um, because we, you know, we're a small nonprofit and we have a big data set that much time to use it. And we can sort of add small things to our protocol that can help with other projects. So as an example of some of those, uh, we worked with Allison Nelson, who at the time was a grad student at San Francisco State. Uh, she worked on hermit thrushes, um, looking at migrations. So she banded them at CCFS and also at uh, Marin with Point Blue and found that those two wintering populations um, migrated to different breeding locations and used geolocators to track that. So that was kind of cool. Uh, Emily Moffat was a uh, grad student at San Jose State University and she, we collected uh, feather samples from Western flycatchers. So she was able to um, do stable isotope analysis to determine where those um, flycatchers spent the breeding season or more specifically where they grew those feathers. And then Gina Barton, who actually was a previous uh, manager at CCFS, um, did her graduate work at Kansas State and use the database to look at um, changes in the timing of spring migrants. And that was published in the AUC uh, a couple of years ago. Some things that we're working on now, we're helping with the bird genoscape project. So that's, you probably are familiar with that. We just pull two feathers and they can use that to get DNA. Um, both to look at, make the initial maps of the genetic, genetic diversity on the, of the whole range. And then for migrant species, they can match up those migrants to the breeding populations. We work with a variety of San Jose State University and Stanford University graduate students um, on all, all different kinds of projects. We're also currently collecting California toey and common yellowthroat blood samples for a couple of projects. Um, and that's something fairly easy that not all of our banders will do that, but there's enough of us that can do blood sampling that we can, we can do targeted sampling like that. And then every year for the last three years, we've worked with Santa Clara University, uh, a restoration class that they come out and get a data set from us to look at some aspect of uh, bird and habitat relationships. And that's been a very productive um, collaboration. And then some things on our radar that we're interested in developing or are in partly in development. Uh, we want to add some MODIS towers. This is automated radio telemetry. 
Um, mostly it's going to be with things from like the white crown sparrow size and up, but there's some, some, uh, there are some uses for smaller species uh, for these. We have a grant with, um, in collaboration with Stanford and Jasper Ridge Biological Preserve to develop a program that we're calling SOAR, which is Student Opportunities in Avian Research. And the idea is that it'll be um, education modules for undergraduates that they can do at the banding station and at Jasper Ridge. Things generally uh, centered around um, studying birds. And we're, we're still working on that. So we don't know exactly how that's going to work out. But so far, that's been, been really a lot of fun. And then some things that we, the SFBBO staff, are working on is um, Katie LaBarbera, who's a Berkeley grad, is now manager of the station. And one of the things she's working on is uh, whether there's a capture bias related to net height and the specific panel of the nets. She's also interested in social interactions among, uh, mainly among the, the winter uh, sparrows that we get so many of. I'm working on uh, molt migration and orange crowned warbler and a few other species. Um, and then we're also trying to clean up the old data set so that we can get a longer span of data back to uh, the, the mid 1980s. The other um, new development that will be coming online in the next month or so is that we'll, we're developing an online data entry system that will basically be real-time data entry. So when the bander catches a bird, when it's a recaptured bird, they'll enter the number and they'll be able to see the records. And <clears throat> if it's a new bird, there'll be various um, steps where it reminds the bander of things that they need to record. So once this system is in place, uh, we'll have, it'll be much faster to be able to use the recent data and it will improve uh, the proofing, uh, the quality of the data will be better. And so, yeah, that was a brief introduction. Uh, I wanna thank the Water District and of course all the SFBBO staff, past managers and all the members that support us. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer those or try to. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, Dan. Um, does anybody have any questions? I have a couple, but give other people a chance I, if they have questions. I had a question about, hi, Dan, thanks for the great talk. Um, I wanted to know, so the decrease in numbers you're seeing, do you think it relates to really habitat loss in the area? And I guess a follow-up to that is, have you guys done any trapping of birds or netting nearby to see if you're seeing the same birds that are in your habitat? Um, probably part of it is the urbanization and loss of habitat around us. Um, we don't have a really rigorous way to test that that I know of. Um, Part of the decline though is probably on site, just the changes in the vegetation as the restorations, because they started from you know, bare ground and then grew up. So there was a period of time where the capture rates were high when most of the vegetation was at net level. And then as it grows, it's declined. But I'm sure some of it is from urbanization. We just don't have a good way to look at that yet. Uh, Rory said he has a question. Hi, Dan. Yeah, thank you for a great talk. Um, I was just curious with the with the banding data, I imagine you're taking the standard morphological measurements. And so I'm wondering if anybody's analyzed that data given your long temporal data set. I mean, there's, there's been really fascinating work from, you know, birds that were collected at McCormick Place in Chicago over time showing changes in morphology related to changes in migration and, and climate. And so you might have a parallel data set to that that could be you know, extremely powerful. Um, so I was curious whether anybody's, you know, if you, have you got that data? Has somebody started working on it? Do you see anything in the data? Um, the only thing that's been done in that regard is that some of our data was used in the 
sort of the regional analysis on change in body size in birds. And that was with, with Point Blue and several other stations that use that. Um, aside from that, nobody's looked at the morphological aspects over time. So that's certainly something that could be done. Not very cool. A lot of opportunity there. So yep. along those lines, I mean, it sounds like you're kind of looking for more collaborations. Is that correct? That's correct. It, um, <clears throat> it, it sounded like you were taking blood from some of the animals. Is that right? And, what, and what, over what time frame uh, have you been doing that? Uh, it comes and goes with the project. Right now, the only two that we're looking at are California toey and common yellowthroat. Um, and we're pretty much, we've gotten our quota of California toey. Um, so just common yellowthroat for now. But if, if, you know, if somebody is working on a particular species, um, we can, in most cases, we can probably add that in. It doesn't take that long to do that. And are you archiving those at the station or where are those samples? What's <clears throat> they get sent them? back to whoever the PI on that project is. I, I was also curious about whether there are any species that were present at the outset in the, in the 1980s and have disappeared entirely or vice versa? Yeah, um, California quail is a big one. Um, that's partly habitat and partly sort of isolation getting cut off by all the freeways plus all the feral cats that are down here. Um, they've been hammered. So a lot of the similarly um, species from open countries. So we used to get you know, loggerhead shrike and things. They're still in the county, but they're just not at the banding station. So, um, and let's see, we used to get dozens and dozens of house finches per day, and we don't get those anymore. Uh, they're still around, but they're mostly active above net level. And mostly when we catch them is when in the, when the blue elderberries are fruiting and they come down a little bit lower. Um, as far as new species, uh, we are getting things like um, white-breasted nuthatch, which we didn't used to get, um, surprisingly, but in the riparian woodlands, a bunch of those trees are dying and potentially offering you know, more cavities and habitat that wasn't there before. So there are, there are a handful of species that are increasing. Anybody, any other questions? Do you, um, I have a question just, um, do you train volunteers or do, like, you know, we often have students, undergraduates that are looking for these kinds of opportunities, but they don't have the experience or the training. Um, are you open to training people or do you want people that already have banding experience and netting experience? Um, under normal circumstances, we do training. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so once things return to normal, yeah, that's a, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it's a bit of a drive from Berkeley. It's about an hour, but we've had, we have people that come from two hours away that are regular volunteers. <laughs> so it, it can be done. Um, and the three projects I mentioned that were graduate student projects, um, all of those people trained at CCFS and part of the deal was they volunteer. So they help us out while we help them out. Okay, yeah, that's great to know. Carla, I can kind of <clears throat> speak on this a little bit because I actually volunteered at the SFBBO nine years ago and was a full-time volunteer for a whole summer. And this is oh. really where I got my, got my teeth sharpened on bird banding and bird morphology. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Did you know anything before you started or? So? Uh, I knew how to prep specimens because I taught myself in college, but didn't have any field experience. So yeah, I, yeah. Met, I see Josh in that picture. I haven't, I should email him and say hi. <laughs> but yeah, he was very um, willing to train and take me on. <laughs> Yeah, it's great to know. Good to know because, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. A lot of our students want field experience and it's really hard to get. So, um, the other person in this picture is Katie the Barber. Yeah. 
Yeah, I see that. I didn't realize she was managing the station now. That's that's great. Um, I have a question on your, your gape wet thing. So did you also look at skeletons or fluids or did you just look at steady skins? Or can you look at just just steady skins? Okay. Some of the some of the records you sent me were of skeletons, and that's what I was wondering. And and fluids preserved specimens. So I wasn't sure if you were able to combine those kinds of data or not. So I'll get back to uh, you on that then. Yeah, I looked at a few, but I, you know, like you say, I wasn't sure how to make the measurement of a skeleton consistent to this study skin because it would be a little bit different. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, well, if no other questions, let's thank Dan for a great talk. Appreciate you doing it. And uh, hopefully when things return to normal, maybe we'll send some people your way. <laughs> yeah, sounds good.